Hello, world. You're listening to Eleanor Wagner's Strange and Scary World here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network, where we're always creeping it real. I'm your host, Eleanor Wagner. I have my co-host, Cassidy Wagner, here with me. Hi, it's good to be back. Today's episode will focus on visits from deceased loved ones. The most commonly known visitation from a deceased loved one is through a visitation dream, and to those who experience them, they are extremely realistic. Today's guest, who hails from Adelaide, South Australia, is here to talk about her own visitation experience received from her deceased 16-year-old son, Daniel. Please join me in welcoming Diane Spillane. Welcome, Di. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you can join us. Your experience, Diane, as I understand, it's different from the traditional visitation dream most people experience. Your son, Daniel, for all intents and purposes, was a healthy, active 16-year-old young man. When first we spoke, you mentioned the day he passed, there were a few signs to indicate something was going to happen. Can you explain what you meant by this? Certainly. Uh, The day that he was going to pass, I had a few signs, as you said. Uh, It began in the morning on my way into the office. I bumped into a former colleague from one of the other offices that I used to work at. It was a Monday morning and she had had a wonderful weekend. She'd uh, met a psychic medium called Paul, and she was absolutely blown away by him, Um, you know, the things that he had told her and everything. And she said, look, I'm going to give you his number. I'm like, oh, okay. Now, in the past, I'd I'd seen a few psychics over the years, but I hadn't actually seen a medium. And I thought, oh, well, that sounds interesting. That's something that I might, might do one day. Um, that day I wasn't feeling that well and, um, being a woman, (laughs) I had had an IUD for many years, so I hadn't been having a period and I went to the toilet and I was bleeding, which was just completely strange. I just didn't feel good that day. There was, I was just out of sorts. So I ended up leaving work early. Uh, I stopped along the way because I needed to go and see a friend. Um, She was selling a car and it was a little five-speed Celica. And I was going to buy it off her because it was getting close to the school holidays here. And my son Daniel had turned 16 in September. And during the school holidays, I was going to teach him how to drive in a manual. So I did that and then I left her place and I got home and it was around 4, 35 o'clock, something like that. I walked through the door, got changed as I do, walked down to the kitchen and I started to prepare dinner and I got a phone call and ordinarily I wouldn't bother answering the phone because it wasn't a number that I recognised, but something told me that I had to, had to answer the phone. So I did and it was um, friends of my son's grandmother calling me to say that Daniel had collapsed. Mm. Uh, yeah, and it sort of all went from there. <laughs> he just collapsed. He had collapsed. Oh, my goodness. That's all I knew at that stage. Um, apparently, he was still at the friend's house, and the ambulance was there, and they were waiting for me to to get there or something like that. They just said, look, there's the, the ambulance is here. You know, um, they're going to take him to the hospital, obviously. And I didn't know any why, anything. You know, just all I knew was that he had, had collapsed. So I flew down to my room, got <laughs> got dressed into something again, jumped in the car, um, flew down to the hospital and ran inside to the emergency department and said, I received a call to say that my son had collapsed and the ambulance was going to bring him in. And they went, he's not here. Oh, that's a bit a bit strange. So I rang uh, Daniel's friend and I said, what's going on? Where is he? And they said, oh, no, this, the ambulance is still here. They're waiting for you to come. And this was like another, you know, 15 minutes away from the hospital. So 
jumped back in the car, flew down to the house, got there. There's no ambulance. They said, oh, no, they've just left. Oh, God. Oh, my goodness. I know. Back in the car again, flew back to the hospital, and I jumped out of the car. My partner at the time was driving, so, you know, as soon as we got into the car park, I jumped out of the car because I saw the ambulance, and I ran up to the ambulance and actually saw them bringing him out of the back of the ambulance. It's like in the movies, you know, you've got there's somebody sitting on top, you know, pumping him, Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just like chaotic, just... Daniel was laying there, his eyes are sort of rolling in the back of his head sort of thing. Oh. Um, and, you know, they just sort of, you know, sort of out the way, rushed him through. As I'm trying to follow it, follow them, you know, the amb- ambos are saying, it's the mother. So, you know, they <laughs> put me off into this side room um, in the emergency department and uh, as the rest of the family, I'm trying to, was contacting and they were turning up and they were getting sent in there too to to join me and we sat in there for about an hour uh during which time his friends were gathering out outside just outside the emergency department and they were working on him and they didn't know why he had collapsed so they came in to sort of ask questions and I just said look I don't know, I just got this call. So I went out and I spoke to the kids that were there to find out what was going on and gave them as much, you know, then went back in and gave as much information as I could. But teenagers tend to be a bit hesitant to um, declare what they've been up to. Mm -hmm. You know, didn't really help matters. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they worked on him for a good hour, which is quite unusual, but the, the fact that he was only 16 and perfectly healthy is why they kept trying to um, revive him. Jeez. Uh, and eventually uh, a, a doctor walked into the room and I looked at him and I just knew, and he just said, you know, started with, the, I'm very sorry. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Yeah. Um, no mother should have to hear those words. No, no. Oh. I'm so sorry for your loss. Mm. How awful. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Daniel was my, my firstborn, you know, and I'm sure that all mothers can relate to the fact that, that there's always that very special bond with your firstborn child. You know, that's the first time that you truly experience 100% unconditional love. You know, you don't really know love until you've had looked into the eyes of, you know, your child when they've just been born. Your child. Uh, and, yes. you know, and to then have that, that love ripped away. It's awful, mm. awful feeling. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so eventually we got to the bottom of what had been of what had happened. And it turns out that one of their older friends, somebody who was in their early twenties, had um, introduced them to inhaling LPG gas off of the Oh my gas goodness. Gas. Oh, boy, oh, boy. So what they were doing were they were, you know, disconnecting the bottle from the barbecue and sucking back this gas. <gasps> apparently it gives them sort of, a, a, you know, a few minutes of a trippy feeling and, you know, it changes their voice, yada, yada, yada. It's a quick sort of a, a buzz. What they didn't realise was how dangerous it was, what they, they were doing, and... I believe at the time there was no warning about deliberate inhalation on gas bottles back then. So they, you know, they had no idea and I had no idea that this is what they'd been doing. They'd been doing this off and on for a couple of months apparently. But the difference on this particular day was that uh, all the friends had gathered you know, one of their friends' places, and that's when SingStar was really popular. 
you know, on the on the PlayStation. Mm. Have so you heard they of were them? all doing SingStar. Mm-hmm. And the mother had come home and seen all the teenagers, you know, they're all hanging out and doing sing star. And she thought, oh, I know, I'll, I'll do a barbecue for them. So she grabbed the gas bottle, went and filled it, dropped it back home, then went down to the supermarket to buy some meat. And by the time she was in the checkout to pay for the meat, her daughter was calling her frantically going, mum, 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 Daniel's collapsed. Oh, my um, goodness. So what had happened, he had um, had his turn on SingStar. He sang Imagine by John Lennon. And to this day, he still holds the record. Nobody beat his score on it. Um, He sang Imagine. He went out the back. He saw the gas bottle, went, oh, sucked it back. But, of course, it had just been refilled. So the strength of it just knocked him instantly. Um, dropped into oh, the ground. Now he fell to like flat on the ground onto the concrete, and they inside heard him fall. So that's how heavy he, he landed. Mm. And because of the strength of it, it instantly started to shut down his major organ. So, in a way, I'm grateful that they didn't manage to revive him because he would have been a vegetable. And right. That's no right. for him. Oh, no. 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 Oh my goodness! Yeah. My daughter Cassidy, she's she's twenty two, and when they're teenagers, it's it's rough when they're teenagers all around in every respect. Did you ever hear about anything like this, Cassidy? No, no, no. no. I mean, we heard of kids smoking marijuana or doing other things like that, but I've never heard of anything remotely like this. And to hear that a twenty some odd year old man introduced the these kids, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was he ever held accountable? Today? He was. No. 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 Oh no. my. No. See now that's just awful. It is. It is awful. And he was overly friendly towards me for, say, the first oh, not quite year, until. I finally managed to get the truth out of one of Daniel's oldest friends. He he told me who it was that introduced them. And then as soon as um, he knew that I knew, he wouldn't talk to me. Huh. He just avoided me. Yeah. How, yeah. how evil. Yes, it is evil. It is evil. Um, I made a point of raising awareness about this because – this was the first time that I'd heard about it. Mm-hmm. And I believe Daniel was the first person in Australia to die from this. Mm-hmm. I think one person in New Zealand maybe had prior, as well as somebody in the state. So it wasn't a common thing. So it was really important for me to make parents aware that this was happening and to look out for it. Um, so, so, yeah, I did a – What they're did, doing did the is Sunday they're taking the propane tank and they're just – So it's just the, the they're, gas bottle, yeah. Yeah, and they're just turning it on and inhaling it through their sinuses. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And this happened when? Uh – December 2007. So Daniel passed on the 10th. Mm. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, so goodness. I did a, um, you know, story with the Sunday Mail and that sort of thing, and we did an interview with Channel 7 who covered the story, as well as the um, three of Daniel's best friends also did an interview with Channel 7 as well to you know, say how stupid they were and they weren't aware, you know, they had no idea that this would could possibly happen and all the rest of it, just to help to raise awareness. And then in um, January uh, 2008, when school returned, uh, the first uh, assembly for the year, I, uh, my family was invited to go because they did a little, um, you know, tribute for my son. 
and I uh, mm-hmm. wrote a speech and got up and, and spoke to the students about what happened to my son because you know what it's like stories uh, sort of change you know one person tells a story and then it sort of slightly changes by the time they tell it to the next person and yada 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 so it was important for everybody to hear exactly what had happened from the horse's mouth so right. to speak yeah uh, to, to get things right um, uh that year, I'm pretty sure they added the um, warning about deliberate inhalation to the gas bottles here as well. Well, thank you for bringing awareness to the public about it. Mm. After such a to endure, hopefully you're making a difference in the lives of others in educating them about the harm and what can happen. Yeah, uh, I think that sort of thing is sort of slipped slipped from memories. Maybe now, uh, it was last year I read that there was a boy in Port Lincoln, about the same age as Dan, who did the same mm. thing. Mm. Yeah. Well, you're here today. I'm you're here, here today, <laughs> and you're talking about it. And yeah, it's going to get out there. The people are aware of it, and yeah. hopefully that will make a difference as well. Yeah, the definitely. more you talk about it, the more that people will learn and listen. That's right, because you don't think. You don't think to look out for this at all, you know. I remember one day no. I, my daughter had said, Mom, like Dan had a friend over, and she said, Oh, Mom, I could smell, I'm pretty sure I could smell gas. And I thought they were uh, around, maybe doing a flamethrower or something like that. You know, I never yeah. for a second considered the fact that they were actually inhaling it. I mean, it's really, it's awful. Who would do that? Like, mm, yeah. yeah. Mm. You, know, you just don't think of that at all. No. Sorry. My goodness. Now, okay, so after, after Daniel had passed, I thought straight away how I'd bumped into my friend who had mentioned the medium. Uh-huh. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I just had this really strong desire to make contact with that person. So I did. I contacted him, Paul, his name is, and uh, he came to my home. He came to visit me, and this was – so Daniel passed on the Monday. Paul came to my home on the Saturday. Um, He knew nothing about what had happened or what have you. I just contacted to say that I would like to – I'd like to have a reading with him. And a reading um, of some sort. Yeah. yeah, Well, he's a psychic medium. And uh, so on his drive to my place, which took him a good hour or what have you, he was living somewhere up in the hills. Along the drive, he was picturing a young boy who had been abducted in – who lived in Queensland. Now, this boy had been abducted in 2003 and Paul had um, lived in Queensland for some time and was sort of doing something with, like, the local psychics and that sort of thing. They were still trying to find, find him and find out what happened to this boy who had gone missing. So the first thing he said to me when he came in, um, he said, do you have anything to do with with Queensland? And at the time, I had been working uh, for the Department of Human Services, and once a year, I would go and um, stay there for five weeks of the year to work in the t- uh, testing area, systems testing. So that was my only association with it, and I said, that's what I did. It's going, no, no, it's not that, it's not that. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's really my only connection with there. And he's going, do you have a connection with Daniel Morecambe? That was a boy that was abducted. And I said, no, no, I've heard the story, obviously. You know, it was all over the news and everything for years. And, and I said, 
but my son's name was Daniel. And that was it. That was the introduction. Mm -hmm. He was that's, that's, seeing that's Daniel Morgan he because has. my son's name was Daniel. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. because sometimes they get these, they have to find a way of getting the medium to understand what they're trying to say. And he knew he yeah. would know the Daniel Morkum case, and that's why he mm -hmm. got, that's how we got him to say his name. Well, Amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Amazing. I started from there, and then he started to talk about things that I knew. He couldn't possibly knew. He's a complete stranger. Uh, another example was Daniel told him, he said, uh, showed him the fence and Paul said did somebody drive through through a fence a, a boy drive through a fence and I said yes when we were living in the house before the one we were living in then uh, a young teenage boy had decided to borrow his dad's car he made it around the corner and he lost control and he came through our front fence <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, there was no way that Paul could have known these things, you know, just lots of little things like that. And mm -hmm. um, just to confirm that it was definitely him coming through. And Paul was really quite blown away when afterwards I told him that Daniel would only pass on the Monday. Because it was so soon after. So soon. And, and Daniel was so strong, you know. Uh -huh and able to come through with so many things to validate the fact that it was him. Mm -hmm. He was blown away. And I, and I said, Daniel was an old soul. I saw that in his eyes when he was born. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel also actually used to see things like he'd say, Mum, Mum, did you just see that boy? Ah, okay. So he was sensitive uh, to spirit. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so um, he was able to come through and connect very easily. Oh, yeah, absolutely. More reason to understand why he would be able to get through to you and connect like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, So is that, is that what you would consider one of the visitations, Diane? Or is it one something of the visitations, yeah, one of them. Okay. That was the first one. <laughs> uh, uh, so during uh, that day uh, while Paul was there, Paul was there for a few uh, hours, and I, I had a, a couple of people drop in but Paul started to go off and talk about a few things and they had nothing to do with me or my who else was home I think my partner was there and my daughter was there had, none of us could relate to it next minute knock 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 on the door a friend turned up that I, I wasn't expecting anybody and they didn't know that I was having a medium there that day they walked in Paul looked at my friend and said yada yada and they went Yep. Daniel was letting him know about things about the people that were about to visit and knock on my door. Mm. So he was <laughs> coming up with. He was coming in and he was acknowledging, he was letting them know that he was here by sharing something that he knew about them. Mm. That I oh, that's know. incredible. Incredible. Mm. Amazing. So that happened. I had two friends drop in that day, and that happened with both of them. Yeah, so it really helped That's wonderful. validate the whole the whole visit. You know, it was it was lovely, and it was, I I got a lot of comfort out of it, and I think mm, it helped me sure. get through. You know, the next few days because of course we had the funeral and everything to deal with. You know, I mean, he died two weeks before Christmas. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, yeah, it, yeah, it was yeah. a hard time, <laughs> and I, I don't know. I don't know if I re really would have got gotten through it as Not well sure. without having that had that comfort that I I had that connection with him. Uh, to know that he's so, always with you. Yeah, definitely, he's he's with me, and the the lovely thing with Paul is. I'll randomly get a text message or something from him. He'll go, oh, is such and such happening? Or did you get a cat? Or whatever. And it's just Daniel letting him know that he's still to, watching and to let him know that, oh, you know, that aware is of what's going on. Yeah, so it's lovely because we've had this um, nice ongoing You're directly friend talking to you through. Yeah, a friendship uh, came of that relationship because now he's talking through the medium to you in the only way that he can. That's so good. That's great. 
That's great. So, so what ends up happening is Daniel ended up helping Paul with his readings. So he oh, would wait, show him so for years. He would show him things, help him by showing him things to help him then relate everything to whoever he was doing a reading with. Wow. That just shows how strong Daniel's, you know, soul and person was. Yes, definitely. I feel. Mm-hmm. So apparently Daniel worked um, with children, who um, teenagers who were crossing. He was there to help them. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah, so it's lovely that he had that purpose to help others, you know, who, who were passing at, you know. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I'm going to have a screw it. <laughs> so the next time that I heard from Daniel through a different avenue was a, quite a few years later. I think it was about 2014 from memory. Uh, my daughter had won uh, via the radio uh, two tickets to go to the Body, Mind and Psychic Expo that's held here in May every year at the Adelaide Showground. So it's quite a big expo in a pavilion. And I hadn't been to one for quite a few years. And when I'd gone, like it was sort of, you know, stalls. So they'd have all different bits and pieces, you know, for sale, clothing, you know, crystals, um, lots of different uh you know, tarot readers and palms and healings, you know, all that sort of thing, all in this great... You name it, psychic, they had it, yeah. (laughs) Yes, everything psychic, they had it there, right? Um, (laughs) So she'd won the tickets and I went, okay, yeah, that that sounds good, we'll go. And we were looking around and what have you, and then there was um, like an announcement about some show about to start and I I didn't know that they were going to have anything on that day. And, um, excuse me, have a sip of my water. Yeah, so they were having, about to have this show start. And my daughter said, oh, I'm going to go over and have a look and see what it's about. I went, yeah, okay, no worries. You go and, go and look. I'm, I'm just going to keep looking around the stalls, which I was doing. Uh, so I was looking at the different bits and pieces and then, you know, I could hear this talking going on. And then all of a sudden I heard, Daniel is looking for his mother. Oh. Is Daniel's mother here? And I stopped cold. <laughs> I looked at my phone. My daughter is texting me going, Mum, did you hear that? <laughs> just, this man just looked at me and said that. I'm like, oh okay, I'm God. coming. So by this time, mm-hmm. like she, she was sitting down right at the front in front of the stage on the floor. And by this time, like it's about, you know, there's hundreds of people gathered around to watch this. <laughs> so I'm trying to make my way through the crowd and people are sort of looking at me because I'm trying to get through. I'm like, so I just started saying, excuse me, I need to get through. I'm Daniel's mother. Excuse me, I need to get through. I'm Daniel's mother. <laughs> and it was like, you know, the sea parting to let me through. And I got yeah. through, found my daughter, sat down next to her, and um, uh, he was um, Mitchell Coon. He was speaking to another couple on the stage at the time. He paused. He looked at me, and he said, Daniel's mother? I went, yes. And he went, I'll be with you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he finished up with that couple, and then he called me up. And, uh, yeah, he just started coming out with all these things to validate. Like he started with, oh, Daniel just wants to say he's so sorry, Mum. So sorry, Mum. You know, and that gets the tears going straight away, right? Oh, sure. (laughs) Because I know he's sorry. I know he didn't intend to 
to go when he, he went. Right. He knows how stupid it was and all the rest of it and how much how much it hurt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But to yeah. have that very public announcement and then, like, just, you know, out of the blue like that, I didn't know that there was going to be a psychic meeting sure. there that day. <laughs> so, you know, I wasn't prepared. Daniel did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't go searching for this one. <laughs> But it was really lovely to have that validation again, completely unexpected and in front of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people like that. Yeah, it was just. My goodness. Yeah. um, I don't know how to describe it really. I mean, Mitchell Coombe is quite a well-known psychic medium over here in Australia. He, um, I believe he has a column in one of the women's magazines as well as he used to, I'm not sure if he still does, he used to uh, have a, make an appearance on one of the um, morning television shows, I think on Channel 7 or something like that as well. He's authored several books, you know, he's, yeah, he's definitely not a sham. <laughs> and it was lovely too. I went and actually, you know, thanked him after he'd finished doing his show at the end of it and, I met him. It was very lovely. Yeah. But it just, I guess because it had been quite a few years since I'd had anything like that, you know, happen as well, it was just so nice to be able to hear from my son. Mm. To get yeah. it again, yeah. And yeah. your your visitation is definitely the non-traditional way. I, too, have had visitations from deceased loved ones. My own father came to me in a wake dream or what some people call a twilight state of dreaming. On the morning of his death, I was in New Jersey, in our home in New Jersey, when I was traveling into Manhattan to get to the, and I had gotten caught in bumper to bumper traffic on the bridge on one of the hottest days in the summer. And I still remember my father's voice in my head, turn off the air conditioning because you don't want the car to overheat. <laughs> so yeah. I did. I turned off the air conditioning. I rolled down the windows and I was dying because it was bumper to bumper traffic. And all of a sudden I had a screen appear in front of me as if I was at a drive-in movie, if you've ever heard of a drive-in. And there I was sitting watching this screen. And now it was as if I had watched a full-fledged movie, but it really was only minutes that this took place. And what I could see was my dad walking through a misty fog and he was sad and upset and angry and frightened, really all negative emotions. And then when he got to a certain point, a woman who turned out to be my husband's aunt Anne, who had died the year previously, was there to greet him. And she said, hey, Carl, do you remember who I am? I'm Anne come on in. There are others that want to see you. So she kind of like guides him to a circle of lighted beings. That's the only way I can describe them. They were beams of light, but they were in shapes of bodies. And even though I couldn't see them physically in their earthly form to say, oh, they're so-and-so, I knew who they were. And when she brought him to them, he immediately recognized them all and was ecstatic. They were his deceased brothers and sisters and his mother and his best friend. And suddenly all those negative emotions that he had been feeling disappeared and and happy and excited and just all these wonderful things that he was experiencing. And they embraced him and surrounded him. And then they suddenly parted to make way for this beautiful cherubic young woman who came up to him and embraced him and said hi daddy it's me caroline now caroline was my sister who passed away in jamaica and there she was greeting him at the gates of heaven so that was my visitation with Mm. my dad and that was the first time they came to me because that wasn't the only time and the thing about that was I was able to share that story with everybody at his wake in his funeral. So I must have told that story over and over and over again. I don't know how many times because it was just such a wonderful story. And so that was one of my visitations with my dad. The other time 
was when I was having a mommy and me moment with my firstborn, just like you were talking about that, that special bond you have with your child. And we're, we're sitting there in the rocking chair with the lights dim and I'm just having this mommy and me moment with my daughter and her bedroom slightly ajar at the time. And all of a sudden this smoke comes wafting through the doorway and the hair stands up on the back of my neck. And I literally thought the house was on fire. And I, I jump up with the baby in my arms to go to the door to shout down to my husband, Steve, the house is on fire. And when I open the door, there's no smoke in the hallway. It's behind me, wisping itself in a circular motion until it went out the wall. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that was my dad. So he's come to me in, in other ways. I'll smell his sweat on occasion, you know, that sort of thing. Um, then my mother-in-law, which I wouldn't label a visitation dream either, but in a sense it was a visitation or a telling of sort because when the night that she passed away, I knew that she was gone. And she had always said when she was alive, if there's some way that I could let you know, I'm going to. And she, too, did as well. I mean, she came to our home in hospice to die. And we didn't know how long she would last, but she never made it 24 hours. And she was in the dining room in a hospital bed, and that was just below the floor from where my bedroom was. So when, when I was upstairs laying in bed, I could hear her breathing and the oxygen machine when I went to bed. But when I woke up at 3.17 a.m. in the morning, all I could hear was the oxygen tank. And so that's how I knew she was gone. Mm. And I remember specifically looking at that clock and seeing 3.17 a.m. This morning, the phones me up to see how did we fare during the night. She knew my mother-in-law was coming to our home in hospice. And I said to her, she had passed. And she had said, oh my goodness, you know, I was thinking about you all night. My husband and I, we couldn't sleep. We got up, it was 3.17 a.m. in the morning, and I said, holy cow. She didn't say 3 o'clock in the morning. She didn't say 3.30 in the morning. She said 3.17 a.m. to me. And for me, that's not a coincidence. That 3.17 a.m. that she came out with was the 3.17 a.m. I noticed when I woke up, and that was my mother-in-law telling me she was okay. So to me, that was her visitation in that respect. And then I had that wonderful story to share with everybody at her wake. So I think people just kind of <laughs> yeah. come to me in that re in that way, you know. Yeah, my yeah. um my youngest son recently had an incident at his work, and um, he swears that Daniel helped helped him to get out of it. He was um, working in Roxby and in a confined space amongst poisonous gases. Oh. And his apparatus, had, something had um, been connected wrong on his apparatus by the person who set it up, and he lost his oxygen. Oh, boy. He was like five... Um, levels of scaffolding high and um, limited visibility because of all the dust and everything in this area and he couldn't breathe. He had no oxygen. He knew that he couldn't take a breath of yeah. what he was in because it would kill him. Oh, boy. So he had to just hold his breath and he made his way down all five levels and rolled out into the, the safety area and out under the shower. He, rather than going down the stairs, he, he used his brain. He thought in the moment and he went over the side and was sort of like climbing down the scaffolding and just sort of jumping to the next level, then climbing, jumping. That was the fastest way that he could get out whilst holding his breath, no, you know, very oh. limited visibility, and he made it out. He made it out and he said Daniel was showing him the way. Oh, my goodness. Mm. And if he and that believes only, that, I believe That was only just over a month ago that that happened. Now, how and if he believes that, that happened. Have, oh, yeah. How horrific would that have been if he had died 
inhaling poisonous gas. Jeez, yeah. The similarities mm. alone. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He definitely, he definitely, he definitely was helped, helped him out. Him. Yeah, definitely. I was in a car once and uh, with a friend who was driving and it was a wet road and the car slid and it was heading towards a tree. I was sitting in the back and I saw a hand come out and grab the wheel and turn it. Mm. No coincidence uh, there. Dan has been around a lot. He, is mo- he used to move things in the old house for mm. like. Things of his, he would put, I would find, just in odd locations. Um, And I often heard his voice coming through the front door. I could hear his voice. Hi, Mum, what's for for dinner? You know, it's just so so there all the time. Like he was always, always. Well, around. I've heard, I've heard of that. I've heard of that. Mm. People saying visitations of them moving our items here. And if people believe they get visitations from deceased loved ones in symbolic flies, feathers, hummingbirds, butterflies. I've heard clouds, coins, even birds. I mean, I firmly believe my father-in-law, I mean, my father and my father-in-law and my mother-in-law come to me in birds. Others say they have visits through smells or touches or in other ways of using the five senses. In some instances, when a loved one dies from old age or an extended illness, when they come to family members in dreams, they look younger and healthier than they did in life. I don't know if you've ever heard any of this yeah. stuff, yeah. but you, you were just mentioning about the voices. People hear their voices. Oftentimes, they hear them calling their names out, like you just said. And it can also be internally in one's mind. Like, you'll just hear it. Nobody else would, but it's clearly audible to you. Mm. I've even interviewed people who have claimed to receive phone calls from their loved ones after they've died. Daniel used to write text messages on his own old phone. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. Yes, I know. I know. Like, um, I, I was using his phone for a little while. And, like, you'd start typing, but then there'd be other things typed in. Like, it was really quite, quite bizarre. Mm. Oh, I believe you. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah, he, he's amazingly strong. Uh, my, my grandmother, uh, a while after she passed, I went with some friends to, like, a, um, a spiritual church meeting. One one uh-huh. evening, and I was sitting there, and I just had this feeling. I could feel some some warmth, and then I could smell, could smell my grandmother. Like she had a very distinct scent, and mm-hmm. you know, it, and it was lovely, a lovely scent, and I just knew that she was there with me. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. People often try to get a tangible sign of sorts from a loved one by asking them sometimes to do something specific. And when it happens, then they know, like they'll say, for example, I hadn't seen or heard from my mother after her death in, in a while. And the summer had come and we were already into the middle of the summer and I had not even seen a hummingbird at, at, at that point. Usually my yard of perennials is filled with hummingbirds mm. at, from the beginning of summer to the end. And I hadn't seen one. And so I was like, well, I haven't seen my mom. My mom, mom, did you make a hummingbird? And within 24 hours, I saw my first hummingbird. So that's kind of what I'm trying to say. If somebody is asking for something specific, when it happens, they know that that loved one has followed through with their request and it's a sign that no one can ignore. Mm. People have even seen their loved ones in full body form. It almost as if they're standing there. They'll see them walk through their house or as if they're actually there. Mm. I would love that. that. I would love to have that happen. One, one, um, evening when I was visiting Daniel's grave I was at night time and I think it was Christmas and I'd gone down to you know 
just sit there and have a chat with him. Sometimes I do that. Mm -hmm. And then I actually, I I managed to capture it on my phone. I videoed it. There was this, this light that appeared around near his um his grave I'll, I'll have to forward it to you so you can have a look oh i would love to see that yeah, yeah it was it was truly amazing but it was just like there was no light anywhere like there was no way to be able to sort of explain it explain it other than it was just him getting my attention yeah yeah well regardless of which sensing they're present in itself it's a visitation a visitation whether it's in that light or in that dragonfly or in something that they've moved, it's no doubt that they're always around us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, always. absolutely. Absolutely. I remember a reader of mine, a reader of mine, uh, John Pagan is his name. He was visited numerous times in dreams by his deceased nephew. Now, he's also very sensitive. So when somebody's already sensitive to get those visits, it's even more um stronger i guess i would say prevalent. yeah prevalent and strong yeah. yeah he um would the deceased nephew would make him smell marijuana and cigars and that was indicative of him in life he smoked marijuana mm-hmm. and cigars so when he would smell it and then he would actually hear him talking in his head <laughs> <laughs> but John's sensitive, like I said, so it makes sense mm-hmm. that the dead try to get his attention. His friend's daughter had died of a drug overdose, and she was intent on getting John's attention. But she knew that John would sense or hear her so that if she wanted to get a message to her parents, all she needed to do was to get it through John, like she did with the medium that you had spoken about with your son. Um, Patrick was that his name? Patrick, yeah. So, um, which one? Paul. Oh, Paul. Paul. The first one was Paul. Paul. The, way, yeah. the, way she, yeah. the way she got his attention was she literally put herself in the rear view mirror of his car. <laughs> and as I said, he was convinced it was because he wanted her, um, she wanted him to be able to tell her dad that she was okay okay. and at the time john did not know that his friend passed away this was a little within the the time frame that it Mm. it was it was unfolding i guess i should Mm. is the best way to describe it and then i've also heard of uh stories of people there was one um uh, another reader of mine had um said that at the funeral when they were driving in traffic the hearse was in front of the car and you know you had the the procession of cars behind it well there was the hearse with his casket and then she was in the vehicle right behind and then the procession of cars but they were in the midst of traffic and she's sitting there just watching the hearse and she could actually see his figure hovering beside his casket and he was with his pet his pet dog a, a little dog that had passed away and that's how she knew it was him and it's probably how he knew he would make her understand that it was him because he was holding his beloved pet so people get these signs in so many various different ways yeah. but if you think it's a sign and you know it's a sign it is a sign that it's just the best reminded way I can me say the it. morning of daniel's funeral i was getting ready and um i had like a little stereo in my in my bedroom and it had like a cd stacker sort of thing and it came on <laughs> and it played, you know, uh, ABBA Waterloo. Oh, yeah. Yes. We were going to the Waterloo Hotel that day after the funeral to have drinks and what have you, you know. Right. right. We were going to the right. Waterloo Hotel and, <laughs> yeah, Waterloo came on that morning. Aww. So it, that was sort of a way – as well, I guess, of acknowledging Definitely. that he, he knew what was happening through the day. And Those little the, nuances. A friend of mine who was a good friend and she knew Daniel very well as well, He, um, she was doing recording the music for the funeral. And it was meant to be in a particular order, but apparently he kept, there was some interference with, with it. And he got he got the songs to be played in the order that he wanted them. 
<laughs> and she complied because prior to prior to him passing, she'd been having she was living in a house that was quite close to some radio towers, and every time she tried to go on like the landline, there was often like radio signals coming through the phone calls. And this was one of the things. She was one of the visitors that day that just rocked up unannounced when I had pulled medium over. And he mentioned the radio waves. So eventually, after all of this and the music and everything, after that, the radio waves disappeared from her phone so she was able to have phone calls. So she thanked him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She's also very... um, uh, psychic herself, so yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, there's it's definitely. Always nice. It's always nice. It's always, you know, random. You know, I don't hear, hear from him often, but I know that he's always with me. Right. Yeah. And that's what, that's the main thing. Mm. Pretty enough as well, knowing that he's been helping others, even not being here on earth you know in death he's you know making his mark on the world even if it's not as prevalent mm, that's right yeah that's amazing helping other young people like himself who are passing on for whatever reason to get to their get to the other side yeah and, and helping you said you with had- those readings as well which is quite yeah. You know, that's great. <laughs> he was able to help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So by just by me meeting that, that medium on that day and then Daniel obviously liking him and wanting to work with him. Yeah, that was mm-hmm. great. Oh, that's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> he, he agrees. He's like, yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> 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 There was another oh. reader of mine who said he was going to his, I believe it was his aunt's memorial because she had died in the midst of COVID. And so, of course, they had to put everything off. And it was several months later, they decided to have this memorial and he was going to the cemetery. And he put on a channel with music that she used to like to listen to. And it's not your customary station where you could get pop or blues or something like that. It was probably like the old, um, I can't remember what kind of music, but it was definitely not, it was not country. It was not something that would be familiar to us, but he had, it's an oldies channel and he had to find it and he put it on. He was kind of reminiscing about her while he was driving to the cemetery and his vehicle had one of those pop-ups that would give you the name of the song and the band or the singer who mm-hmm. performs the song in his vehicle. And I think her name was like Marie or something like that, but he's listening to these songs and all of a sudden the name that pops up is Marie. That was the name of the song. <laughs> and, you know, he's to this day convinced it's not a coincidence. He's going to Marie's memorial And he's listening to the station that she always liked to listen to. And a song by the name of Marie comes on. Mm. So he was like, hi, Aunt Marie. You know, this is for you. And those those are the kind of nuances. Those are the kind of experiences that are definitely considered visitations as well. It's there. Them them making their presence known. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Any, you have anything else that you uh, do? You remember? Did you ever get? I, I for some reason I think I remember you saying that you didn't. You feel like you Omi came to visit you at one point. My mother-in-law, they used to call her Omi, and you were sleeping. I think at well, one. Was, uh, my... And I was sleeping, but I felt someone like rub my head. And when I told you in the morning, you said you hadn't done that, so. For me, that was some. She always had done that for to us, right? Or whatever, you know. But for me, that was 
and that she came yeah. to visit you. And yeah, mm -hmm. I, I do believe that. I do. Just, He feels Dan has visited her or given her signs that he was around her. That's you, Diane. Did your daughter? Sorry? It, it, it was cutting out then. I couldn't hear what you were saying. Good. Did your daughter? If she had any experiences or um, visitations from Daniel? Yeah, yeah, she has. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, she... And she herself has gone to see uh, Paul on various occasions to have readings because she's also lost some close friends, sadly. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But she's, she's always a very, a very strong connection with Daniel and she'll often, yeah, contact me to say that she's had a dream about something or whatever just to, just to validate things with me you know things that might have happened so th things that she's been shown to validate yeah. they were actual yeah things that had happened or what have you so yeah yeah well is there anything that you want to tell the public specifically about this this um unfortunate unfortunate incident, incident and and in and, and a warning and an understanding please use this forum to say what you want to say to young kids so the same thing doesn't happen to them. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of raising awareness that, you know, this does happen. You know, I'm dumbfounded as to why people would do it because, let's face it, you know, LPG gas, really, that, that smell is awful, but it's not worth the risk. It really isn't worth the risk. It's just such a stupid, dangerous thing to do. And, you know, such a, um, you know, huge loss of a, a perfectly healthy boy. It's just nobody, nobody needs to go through this. No parent needs to go through this. Just, you know, don't. Don't do it. Be aware. If if you're a parent and you have teenagers and you've been smelling gas or whatever, find out why. Mm -hmm. why. Why? What are they doing? Why are you smelling gas? You know, follow through because, believe me, losing a child this way is just absolutely horrific. Yeah, I can't uh, even imagine. Yeah. yeah. So just be aware that, you know, teenagers do stupid things. Mm. So I, I, you know, I lost my son to teenage misadventure. Mm -hmm. mm. Yep. And lack of education in, mm. and knowledge <laughs> in something of that sort. Never ever dreamt that this was a thing until yeah until that day. Yeah, and you know it's going to haunt that guy for the rest of his life. But and I don't like to wish ill will, but karma really is a bitch. And <laughs> what comes around goes around. And he's probably, I mean, he's already got to live with the fact that he turned these kids onto this horrible thing, mm -hmm. but. And it cost a lot. I'd like to know where, yeah, and I, and I wonder where his life is going himself down the line, mm. you know. Yeah, well, I I don't follow him. <laughs> I, don't no, know. I, I, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. No, I no, just can't say I blame you. I don't need to, you know, look and see. I don't, you know, what if he's having a fabulous life? <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be fair, right? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't think that he is. I, you know, car, I, I'm a firm believer in karma, and I really don't think that he is. So. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Thank you so you much. Know, I for didn't want sharing. to. You know, I wasn't going to scream and yell at him. I just wanted to talk to him and just say why. What you know, get mm -hmm. to try and make sense of it. But the fact that he just wouldn't talk to me about it just really made me angry. Yeah.
opportunity to say he was sorry. Mm -hmm. I think maybe if he came out and he said, I was stupid and immature at 20 some odd years Mm -hmm. and I'm sorry for causing his death and this grief. Mm -hmm. And maybe someday we can only pray and hope that maybe someday he'll be mature enough and look. you want to turn somebody away when they want to say they're sorry. But the fact that he didn't speak to you was horrible. That he just, yeah, that was horrible. Yep. That's all I can it say. Was. It was. Yeah. Oh, well. one day, maybe you'll grow up one day, <laughs> one day. Well, Diane, thank you so much for opening up your heart and home. Caricity and I today, I can't even imagine as a parent burying a child, and I'm so terribly sorry for your loss Mm -hmm. and thankful that you're educating the public about this horrendous thing that kids get involved in. Mm -hmm. And I'm thrilled to hear that Daniel has made something of himself in death, that he's done all this, these wonderful things, and I am positive he is going to continue to do that. And I hope that he comes to you more often. Maybe every couple of years in one way, shape, or form, you'll get another visit and you'll be like, oh, there he is again. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I wish and hope that for you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting yes. me to come chat with you as well. It was wonderful talking to you. I love sharing these kinds of stories, though, because it teaches us a lot more, something new every day that we can share with somebody else. And, and on this platform, we're sharing it with the world. So. Yeah. That makes it even a better thing, right? Yeah, definitely. So thank you. Thank you. I have a special addition to this episode with a prediction from astrologist Richard Clarkson for the week ahead. I had a phone conversation with him recently where he made a prediction, and I wanted to share it with you first. So here it is. Looks like Putin will be thrown out of office on April 8th. On April 8th. Wow. So I'm giving you a forecast as to the actual situation and the actual day. Mm-hmm. A lot of astrologers don't do that. Right. Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna say that it's April eighth that he's gonna be thrown out of office by Congress. By his Congress, the Duma. By the, the Duma. Russian Parliament. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, the, the people are going to pressure the Duma. His own officers. They're all losing money. All the people in power, secondary power that he controls, they're losing their shirt. Right. So it'll happen April 8th. We may hear about something going on by April 12th, but it'll start April 8th. I don't know if we'll hear about it in the news or not right away, but that's that's when it starts. I would like to make it more general as being more general is usually more accurate. I'd rather go out on a limb and actual state what people can look for, but expect something more around that nature, okay? Okay. Okay, I am predicting it, but expect something more around the perimeter of what I'm saying. Okay. In other words, resistance being raised in the Duma, something like that. So, there you have it. Listen to the weeks ahead, and let's see if Richard got it right. Thank you, paranormal enthusiasts, for tuning in today. I hope you'll come back again. Remember to tap into your own gifts. Everyone has them. And in the meantime, make sure you're creeping it real.